Welcome to Building Impossible Applications with uh, <coughs> Drupal and VJS. Um, I'm David Pascadori. I'm the CTO of Cold Front Labs and Spot Zero on Drupal.org. I'm Philip Um I'm a Drupal developer since 2012, uh, working at Statistics Canada. Um, PDCMA on Drupal.org. <laughs> so, a bit of context. We talk about what this presentation is actually going to be. So this project is going to, or this presentation is going to be a case study on a project that we wrote uh, for Statistics Canada. So, who are Statistics Canada? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Statistics Canada is uh, Canada's uh, federal uh, statistical agency. Um, it is heavily uh, invested in Drupal since about 2012. We released uh, the. WebKit distribution in 2012 and very alpha version, and we've been using it internally since then. And a lot of sites <coughs> in the federal government are using our distributions. And outside the federal government. Hmm? And outside the federal. Yeah, government. also. So, so that's pretty cool. We are currently rewriting it in in Drupal 8. We have a new version called WXT. Um, so statistics can publish a lot of statistics and have a lot of data sets. So it has interesting challenges, um, disseminating that type of information. And just so you know, the official abbreviation is StatCan, not StatScan. <laughs> so you'll see StatCan written everywhere. <coughs> That's why. All right. So give us context into the, what the application that we wrote. Um, we wrote an application for uh, a program that Statistics Canada offers called RTRA. The real-time remote access program. Uh, so, what is this? I think it has a very government-sounding name. It's got an acronym. It's kind of confusing. Federal government checks out. So, StatsCan has very large data holdings. They collect a ton of data. The raw, the raw data that they collect from all the surveying and censuses they do, they do um, can't be released publicly because you could glean public information off of it. Um, if you sort of specify things enough, the way you do with Facebook advertising, where you sort of put enough restrictions on your data so that you're only targeting one person, you can eventually do that and sort of violate sort of privacy. Um, at the same time, uh, StatsCan would like to expose this data to researchers so researchers can do fundamental, useful research with all the data StatsCan collects. There's lots of seats over here. You guys Are can you come. Are started or is this the finishing of the previous No, no, we're started. Yeah, we're started. Everybody is confused. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we're out now. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no problem. Don't worry about it. Oh, uh, yeah, there you go. Oh, they're giving you a popcorn now? No wonder no, it's coming up. No, no, no. <laughs> All right. So, uh, continuing to what RTRA is. Um, so what RTRA is, it's a program that allows researchers to query um, all the data while mitigating um, the privacy issues by adjusting the precision. So the system will take a look at your, the result set that's returned before it's returned and will say, hey, you just got data that was about 10 people. So that means the precision you will get will be um, sort of uh, in groups of 50 people instead of like an exact count or when you're getting sort of statistics percentages, if you're taking a percentage of people that decides, oh, you're taking a percentage of 10 people, well, the best precision I'll give you is into the closest 5% or something. So it mitigates privacy issues um, with, uh, with how it handles the rounding of the data. Uh, and the way that this works to allow researchers access to the system without uh, allowing them access to any of the data is that researchers um, write their statistical programs in a language called SAS. 
Um, they use our TRA to transfer that um, from wherever they are on the internet to Indus.can's secure network. Um, they have a place where they can upload it and then some other things transfer it into the back end, which is essentially uh, an air gap, but not really air gap network. Um, the program <coughs> is sort of scanned and validated automatically uh, and then is run against the data sets. Um, the system ad adjusts the precision of all the results so that there are no privacy issues and no methodology, methodology issues. Um, and then it aggregates the results and transfers it back out to the researchers. So re researchers can run um, statistical applications on data that they aren't allowed to see. All right, so some more background into this. As I said, the word SaaS a lot. And it doesn't mean software as a service in this case. Um, SAS is a proprietary um, programming, a statistical programming language and software package for running uh, statistical programs. Uh, the development on it started in the early 60s and it's had sort of con consistent uh, proprietary rele releases of the proprietary software package since the 70s. Um, it's only in since 2014, 2015, that they've released any kind of free version, and it's free just for universities, and as long as you don't do any commercial works with it. Um, and it very much acts like a language that was heavily developed in the 70s. Um, give a bit of context into what statistical programming is. Uh, statistical, there are a few statistical programming languages. Has anyone ever used one? I list R, SPSS, uh, MATLAB. Oh, great. Good. You guys are experts. Um, for, for everyone else, they're, they're programming languages that are designed so that they, uh, they're built to make it easy to run on large sets of data. So that you essentially will have operations uh, that you run, but instead of sort of in a normal programming language where you check a variable, that variable actually represents a table and that operation you're running, like if you run times five, you're actually running this column of this table times five, and so it applies the whole thing to the table. And if you run sort of statistical operations on it, they'll grab the row of the table and then run the whole thing, run it on a much larger data set than in sort of a traditional programming languages. Um, and so the, the results of a statistical programming language program are generally uh, some sort of aggregate or summary or statistical um, answer. So what's the mean of this? Do a bunch of pre-processing to a table, to every row on the table, and then calculate the mean of one of the columns. Or do grab a bunch of data, run some pre-processing on it, merge it together in a certain way, and then get the average of this column. And these languages make it easy to express that. So, we probably have the background of what we're writing a program for, what problem are we trying to solve with this program, this application that we wrote? So, uh, you want to talk this one? You talk about um, I can, now you can do this one. I'll do this one. All right. So, uh, as some of you might already be suspecting, adoption of the R uh, RTRA sort of system is quite low. Um, and that's because there's a lot of caveats to just being able to use it. Uh, programs have to be written in SAS, and I'm sure most of you haven't even heard of SAS before now. Um, to make things even more complex, RTRA only runs a specific subset of SAS. So there's certain banned functions. So you can't go manipulating or touching any of the data sets, or, uh, or, or sort of keeping data or making aggregates of data that don't use the vetted processes, that use the correct methodology, all of that stuff gets scanned out and your function will be, your, your program will be rejected. Um, so you, if you, even if you are lucky enough to know SAS, you need to understand the RTRA variant of SAS to be able to write these programs. Um, because it's a statistical language, and you start with a big data set, um, you, well, sorry, it's more, more specifically, to even get your program to run and to tell, what, to tell the system what data set your program needs to run against, you have to give your program a magic name that has some standards that to, to pick out which data set you're running, 
and then put some embedded information in there. So if you screw it up, your program will be rejected. And because you're uploading your program something and then somewhere, and then you wait, you check, and you get your results back, the sort of development feedback loop is quite slow. You don't really know how long it could take. You could wait an hour or half an hour and then be like, oh, I didn't know what to do with your program because you named it silly. Um, or name the file silly. So that's a problem. Um, well, let's say that's all great. Um, you need a bunch of documentation. You need the documentation for the sur surveys that you're writing a program to do statistics against. Um, and that is because these surveys have very massive tables. Some of them, um, the tables that they generate, have, what was their biggest one, 5,000 variables? Yeah. They have 5,000 columns. So that's not how many rows of data they have. They have 5,000 data points they've collected. So if you want to like, select out what data points you want to look at, you need to know what those columns are called, which means you need the documentation for that survey data set. And you need to go through it, and then you need to look at not only what the variables are called, because they have sort of a machine name, but then you need what the, their, the English name is, you can understand what it is, and then read the descriptions, and then most of those are multiple choice answers, for anyone who's ever answered the census. So you need to go and find out what one or two or five actually was, so you have your translation code for that. So if you write your RTRA program and, and, uh, and do your statistical stuff, you need to have this set of documentation, this, <laughs> this set of documentation to figure out you know, what the things you're actually, the questions you want to answer are. And there's a few of them. Like, there's like three or four different places you need. Like, yeah. To different URLs, different sites, the different documents you have to download. So it's, yeah. it's a bit messy. <laughs> On top of that, um, in some of the surveys, there are deleted or renamed variables, depending on what process they have to have. And different year surveys can be different. So there's more documentation for how you deal with that. Um, and so these are all the things you have to keep in mind um, to successfully write programs for this. So um, <laughs> let's come up with a solution. What did the client want? <laughs> yes. Um, I have a slide about the clients later, which we're very fortunate. Um, but yeah, the client wanted some kind of graphical uh, interface where they could allow users to create SAS program without knowing SAS. Because a lot of their um, researchers are, for example, university students. And their researchers, they want to get some data. They don't want to spend time learning SAS. And, it's a and, and people have to pay to get access to these big data sets. So universities are paying for it and students are not using it as much as they could because they have this barrier of entry if you need to learn all these stuff and we've been explaining this for a few minutes now it's a lot of information just to on board before you can actually do anything um, so they want to uh, simplify this process so they want to come some kind of user interface to be able to um, instead of reading your documentation and finding all the surveys that exist and then all the variables in that survey um, why not we just give a list of users, here's all the surveys you can, or data sets you can play with, and all the variables you can play with. So have some kind of interface that ag aggregate all this documentation and allow the, the, the users to actually write the program. Right? So that's basically what they want. Yes. So, um, before this came to us, they had been pitching this idea around internally for a long time, and this project sort of was scoffed out a lot as, this is not possible. You can't write a system to do this. And I would tend to agree, especially with some of the pie-in-the-sky ideas that, that happen. And any, and like, it sounds reasonable if you don't know anything about programming and you haven't really used a lot of languages, but anyone who's used a GUI programming language um, can attest to they are either extremely limited, extremely difficult to actually use in like a kind of professional sense. They, they, some, they demo nicely, but if you need to write a serious program in it, they generally don't cut it. Um, or uh, terrible. Uh, they frequently are various combinations of all those things. Extremely limited and terrible. Or uh, difficult to use and extremely limited. 
Um, and this is just sort of a nature of GUI programming, and it's why uh, their, a GUI <coughs> programming language hasn't kicked the butt of the text editor of, for which they've purported to do since their inception. Um, there are actually a lot of existing SA GUI SAS programming tools, but they sort of suffered from these very, like, as well. They're either, they're mostly, for the GUI SAS ones, they're just too complex to expose to the target audience. Um, it sort of would walk you through it, but there isn't any kind of supporting information for what you need to put in all these text boxes. So the, uh, the, the previous developer, not previous developers, but other developers who this had been brought up to were saying this is not uh, worth investment. It is just sort of the problems that come with the service that we're offering. So, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> yes, um, so before, how to tackle something that seems impossible and it's actually boils down to having great clients. And we've had different clients at, at Stackend. Some are great, some are less great. Um, <laughs> but these, uh, we were extremely fortunate that these people came to us with a problem and not a solution. They were not like, please build this, this exact way with this, this exact parameter and this color and this. You know. They were like, we have a problem. We don't know what, how to solve it. Can you please research and come back to us? And <coughs> We, they were very good um, to just give us a lot of leeway of trying to figure out and then it presented to them uh, in a like, very iterative kind of workflow. Um, so, yeah. They I, I will down, boil down to this iterate, show progress, and collect smiles because they were always smiling. Which was, considering we went into this project not knowing SAS, um, they, their criticism was always constructive, yeah. Um, and yeah, it can't emphasize how much them being on, super on board for this really, really helped this project. So, um, after meeting, after meeting with them, uh, we sort of figured out what we had to build. Uh, we need to build an application that was a programming GUI. Uh, so it had to be very responsive, because it had to be fast um, to interact with. So had to be client-side. Um, we knew we needed a CMS uh, because of the monstrous amounts of metadata we needed to store and get to the user easily. Um, the, we, as we come to find out, we have had tens of thousands of, of variables to store. Um, we needed to be able to check um, programs against variables to do sort of some automated checking to make sure that the, what people were writing sort of we could pre-validate it before they need to submit it to the program. So we need to be able to access that from the CMS. Um, we need to be able to generate valid SAS from whatever was generated in the GUI. And most importantly, it had to be, because it's released, going to be a tool released by the Canadian government, it has to be fully accessible and fully responsive. So you got to be able to write SAS programs from your phone or screen reader. And multilingual. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we forgot that one. Yeah. <laughs> Easy peasy. <laughs> so um, the first thing we did is come up with an architecture of how we were going to, to build this thing. Um, so here's sort of our, accident, our, uh, our application architecture. <coughs> we use Drupal as our main CMS. Um, and then programs people would write, variables, data, data sets, and the SAS compiler uh, would all exist in Drupal to store all that. Um, and then we would put our reactive um, front end GUI attached to Drupal that would be in Vue.js, and that's what people would actually interact with to write their SAS programs. Yeah, it's a, it's kind of, it was kind of built as a decoupled application at first, but we realized that Actually, um, all you need is a user interface for this. Um, so we basically attached it as a WYSIWYG editor. So it's Drupal that's providing it, except it's just a client-side app that deals with it. But it's hosted by Drupal, basically. So uh, just a little bit of background on Vue.js. If people, how many people know what it is here? Or have used oh, it? Oh, wow, all right. Uh, Good crap, okay. <laughs> I'll go very quickly on it. Um, so it's a JavaScript 
uh, framework for reactive components, so it allows you to create really quickly a uh, very dynamic interface on the client side. Um, the three words from the official UGS page is approachable, versatile, performant. Um, I like it more than other framework. <laughs> like, yeah. um, it, it's like I'm purely a Drupal developer for the last I don't know, six, seven years, or well, 2012. Um, and I learned, this is my first project that I learned VGS for. So I loved it. Yeah. Um, why? Because it was very dynamic. And I was just thinking of the pain it would be to develop this in a Drupal uh, way with a lot of like Ajax, -y, the, the Drupal Ajax way of doing things. And I was like, mm, no. So yeah, I, I wanted to go with more decoupled approach for a while, and that was a perfect project to try. So. All right. His so, first task was learn SAS. Step one, <laughs> learn SAS. Uh, so SAS as a language has a lot of idiosyncrasies and a lot of magic. Um, there are really two variable types, numbers, strings, and numbers. Um, and converting between the two of them is strange, it doesn't do it automatically. Um, there's generally a whole lot of magic and a whole lot of really, really old feelings and stuff. Um, and a good example of like weird things in SAS is SAS loves the colon. Uh, it is an operator. <laughs> it is an operator that is used for like 10 different things. And there's actually a paper, there's a white paper I read on it that is about 30 pages long that describes the different uses of, set of the colon as an operator. Because um, you can use it as a comparator, you can use it as, uh, if you use it as a comparator, you can use it in conjunction with other comparators to use that comparator as a comparator between strings. Um, to be like, so you can use it as like, sounds like, and then like, but if you use less than in that, you can be like, or like contains this substring in a list of strings. So it's like it's awesome, and then when you, you can use it, you can use it functionally. You can use it in macros. Like I like. It's, anyways, the language is, is great. Um, the the basic structure of SAS is actually very straightforward, but there's a lot of really spe tricky specifics. Just in terms of like, what are you allowed to put in sort of different, way, the way you're allowed to create variables and what you're allowed to call them and what you're allowed to call data sets is slightly different. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of tricks in it. So, UX. So, we came up with uh, some UX guidelines, what we call our UX values, because how do we build this, right? How do we build the priming, in, uh, priming language in a visual way? Um, the first thing was we had to limit the scope, and that helps because RTRE is also a subset of SAS. Like you can't do everything SAS does. So already we had a smaller scope, but at, even then we could limit it to just some use case of it, like the most useful use case or the, the more basic level. And then just, okay, you can't, because we're not replacing what they have right now. The way they do it right now is they, they program SAS in a text editor and they submit the file and then it runs in the background and come back, it's here, it worked or it didn't work. Um, we're not replacing that, you can still do that. It's just a new way of doing it. Um, so basically our, our competition is a text editor. So if anything was taking too long to do, or was too complex to do, if you had to click 20 times to do something that would take two seconds in a text editor, you're just like, forget it, we're not doing it. It's skip. If, if something we designed was more complex than typing it into a text editor, we just considered it a failure. That was not the right way to do it. Our competition is a text editor. We had to be better than a text editor, so we either meant redesigning or dropping it as a feature. So the, the main thing that was really good uh, by doing this is that we were trying to find the, pat the usage pattern that are really tough to do with just typing some text uh, versus having a user interface. For example, selecting something, knowing what the, the possible list of choices. Like, you have a drop down, you have the list of things grouped by groups. Um, so, it, it's much easier to select something and try to find what the name is and then go type it. Right? Mm -hmm. So, in certain patterns like this, it was very useful. There's actually one pattern that you could demo later. Sure. That 
Uh, we'll get, we'll get, we'll get to it. It's, it's pretty nice. Um, the last thing yeah. is we did not want to put, we did not want the user to have to know the restrictions of SAS before using our program. Um, so we wanted to hide that from them as much as possible. So if they were going to call things, like things that would not be legal in, stat, in SAS, sort of like variable names with like disallowed symbols, we didn't want to expose them to that. We wanted to fix it for them and make sure that they got to from GUI to working program as fast as possible. All right. Uh, so we started to figure out what, you don't, uh, we were just talking about this. We started by figuring out what kind of things people actually wanted to do with SAS. Um, so we got uh, a whole bunch of programs people had actually submitted to the system. And we started extracting uh, goals. So taking chunks of code and figuring out what patterns people were using and what were their goals in running these patterns. And, and, and building UX not around sort of replacing lines of code, but replacing goals so that figuring out what the goals of different parts of code were, because that's something we can ask you a few questions and generate code that does that. Whereas if we're just trying to let you graphically program line by line, um, it's going to be really, really onerous. Um, so we, after that, after we went through that, we sort of extracted about 16 different patterns that SAS programs were made out of. Um, uh, and then we started designing components for implementing those. Uh, and during that, we started reducing the set of goals, patterns, goals and patterns to sort of a minimal set of UI components. Yeah, we noticed at some point it was a lot of duplication, and we were like, we can just merge these together. So. All right. So here's <laughs> here's our pictures of our early notes. I'd go back on my phone and start finding all these as we were taking pictures of scribbles of things we discussed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as, as we sort of started building how we wanted the sections to interact with each other, um, where we wanted UX to be, some pseudocode and how that would relate into a UI. Um, then talking about the API, like what API components we needed. Anything in there you want to talk yeah, about? Yeah, and then we graduated to whiteboarding. <laughs> it became a little bit clearer and then we can involve more people around. You know? <laughs> so we did a lot of this actually. Um, we started with just like, okay, how can we build this component? And we just like, try ideas, right? Um, and then try to code it and go back on the whiteboard and try it. So this is what's kind of the, the usage work, or the design cycle, uh, basically. So I would, we would think, we discuss, we whiteboard something, and then I start building it, I integrate it, I make it pretty, um, I test it, and then does it spark joy? Like, <laughs> is it good? Uh, and most of the time it was like, yeah, it's pretty good. Or no, right? Um, if it fails or it gives value, then we just go back in the same cycle until it's pretty good. Um, and then we're like, yes, this is the perfect component. I love it. But I forgot accessibility. <laughs> <laughs> I had this amazing toggle that was changing color and it was sliding in and out. It was beautiful. It was not accessible. Not a single screen reader could oh, deal man. with it. Screen readers just didn't make it can make a heads or tails. No, it was like it's so on pretty. off. It's not. No, I was changing the label <laughs> dynamically. So yeah, no. So there was a lot of like iteration on this. So it took about I don't know uh, six months, eight months to just iteration different to build the, every component. Um, this yeah. So that's basically our our cycle. All right. So demo. Oh, demo. All right. <laughs> So let's show you what we ended up with in the end. And then we'll talk, we'll talk about its implementation. All right, so uh, I won't zoom in. Okay, we'll zoom in. No, we're gonna go in full screen now because that's more interesting. Um, so the first thing that we ask you to do is put in a title. Um, our titles, you can have whatever you want. And we will actually rename your program when you download it to the magic name, including your title, your title, so that it can it can run in our TRA. Uh, the next session, the next section is you have to select um, which data set you want to actually use. So we have a, a list of all the data sets we have. Uh, do we have LFS in here? That's the one everyone likes. Yeah, yeah. So apparently, is the most labor force survey is the most the most popular one. 
Uh, you can talk about this component if you want. Yeah, so what you see right here is you have, um, you select your survey and then it pops down a table that includes all the variable of that survey. So let's say you stack can uh, give you a survey, let's say the census, then you, or in this case FS, but you get lots and lots of questions and each question is a variable and many of them like multiple choice variable. So in this case you have this is a small one. You have 163 results. Some are like 2,000. Oh, right? Yeah, that's not an exciting one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, is it the Those CH, have? I think, are pretty good. Yeah. Are they pretty good? Yeah. No, yeah it's it's a good one. One. Okay, yeah, this is going to be a good one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, this one. There we go. 1,600. Yeah. So, yeah, so you get two columns here. You get the variable name and then uh, a link to more information about it. So if I would click on this, <coughs> it would fetch um, all the information about that variable. Um, just some... That's not a, can you click on the, the one that's a multiple choice? Uh, go to... Hell, I don't know. Maybe this, there we go. Yeah. So this is what most of them look like. <coughs> the variable of the different possible answers. So, and, then, and you can see, there can be a lot of them. So yes, that's a lot of data points, right? When he was talking about all the columns, that's what it is. But, <laughs> um, so the idea is that you, and you, I could search, like if I just want geo, like it would search a subset of variable. Um, and I want to select a few of them. And I could just click on those. And they get added at the bottom in the selected variable list. And then we can interact, start our program. So you want to continue? Yeah, sure, I can, I can start writing a program. Okay. Um, the way SAS works is you start on data sets and you operate on data sets. Uh, so the first step is to create an initial data set and that's going to work on these two variables. So we will call this step one. Um, and then we can decide what we're going to do from this data. So if we want to calculate something and create a new variable, we have new variable, new var, and we could say we are going to set it to the value of an existing variable, uh, and then we get sort of that linked in, or we could do some sort of math between other variables if we wanted. And so we select these, we multiply that one by four. Um, so for creating variables, we can convert between variables. So we could, oops, let's not put that there. I'll just overwrite it. Uh, a new variable. Let's give this one an illegal name. Excuse me, can yeah? you keep the action towards the top of the screen? Sure, sorry, is it all? Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> so from here, we can uh, convert the value of this into um, different things. Um, so if we have things that are letters, we can convert them into numbers, or we can use, we can also expose custom SAS converters. So that gets lots and lots of fun. So we're getting into like SAS as a very expressive data converging system. All right, we'll just leave that there. Um, the whole time, the yeah. Code? So the whole time while you're doing this, we'll put it in full screen mode. Oops, my compiler failed. This conversion must convert character with data. All right, we're just going to get rid of that. Yeah, we're going to remove that. So the whole time while we're doing this, because this Vue.js system is uh, reactive, every time we make a change, it sends it back to our system to be to compile it. <coughs> so if we if we start changing this number, our uh, our SAS code also changes. Um, one of the more interesting functions we put in is a lot of the patterns we found is what most researchers were doing is they had a call on, is they would, they would, when they were done their program, they would take the values people turn, put her in, like they take the values of the column and then trans, translate them back into what that actually meant in terms of answers. Um, so for example, this variable, um, it stores like 10, 11, but it, it, what it actually said to a person filling out the survey was Eastern Regional. Um, and so at the end of the program, people often sort of wrote that in. So we'll call this text, this. So we wrote, 
a step in it that would actually generate the SAS code that did that. So since we have access to all the variable data, we can create SAS code that fills out the column text on your result table um, with all the, with actually the text values. We saw a whole bunch of like example SAS program, like real ones that people were summiting. So people um, submitted programs with this code in it, and else, they wrote it by hand. The place. So <laughs> this because is, SAS is not that clever, so you need yeah. to do that. <laughs> um, the other thing we that is on all of these clauses is we can add code comments anywhere. Comment one. So where is that code comment going? It's going at the top of the program, comment one. So we can add a comment to this calculation. There we are. It does something. And it'll just fill it out as we do that. Um, we can also add conditionals around everything. So if you really, if you want to change this, is equal to that. So then we can it'll automatically uh, build this. Um, for advanced users, so in data sets, we have a thing just to con just to limit data. So in these data clauses, it'll essentially go over every row and run these to generate your output table. Um, you can have limits so that you can say the exclude these rows from the result. <laughs> Um, I'll with that. We also provided a box just for people to dump in custom SAS. So if they knew what they were doing, they can still use this interface. Um, and then the meat of this is at the end, when you generate sort of these data tables, is you have to run statistics on them, sort of a statistical process to calculate down to what you need. Um, and so you can choose what statistical process you want. Let's we'll say frequency. <laughs> Oh, data set. So let's choose one running on step one. This would be freak. We'll to calculate the frequency of this variable. And then it will actually, we have the SAS <coughs> code for calculating the frequency here. Um, at the end, you can just click download program. And it will download the SAS program with the file sort of named correctly to run in our TRA. Um, so, that's sort of what we ended up with. You can actually write SAS programs. So let's talk about the implementation. So yeah, the, the concept was basically, uh, at first we were like, okay, we just do a decouple application, but then it came up that, well actually, it's, we have a Drupal site that has all this data. All we want to do is generate a program, and a program is stored in uh, JSON. So it's basically a JSON structure um, that we define. It is, okay, which component that you have? What are your values? Um, and we, we want to store that in a text field, like, or like in a, a Drupal field. So what happens on the display side of things is that it will, um, you, instead of displaying like a, a text area field, you just replace it with our view app. And every time we change something, we just right to that field. So um, my journey into this, uh, I didn't know anything about Vue. Uh, uh, before that, maybe a tiny bit. Oh, yeah, quickly. <laughs> OK. Um, so that's the best way I think you should learn something new like this, is to find something very challenging to do with a lot of corner keys that are really tricky. Um, I really like the reactiveness of Vue for this because it was, since we're building a data-driven application, Vue is a data-driven framework. So it was good, it was very fun, the feedback was super fast, I liked it. Um, yeah, um, key points, okay, the application is uh, starts with a JSON config. Um, so we define different type of component, uh, which component can include other components, and it's, it's basically a scaffolding in JSON. Uh, and then we have a central uh, storage layer um, for, oh, oh, here. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, one thing I'm, I need to mention is I <coughs> built a lot of custom components. Like, the, I could build, a, get a lot of a view library from the internet, uh, but, um, because I had to iterate into a very specific type of workflow, um, I used a lot of custom components for control, but also used a third party for all the tediousness of 
building a table viewer or a drop down select list that's computed. So this is basically what you, uh, is the, the meat of the project. You have the Drupal backend that has uh, endpoints, like data set variables, uh, and then you have a compiler. And the view app in the middle here, uh, it's a core, it's called Vuex, it is just like this, the central storage layer of the app that it's all the business logic stays there, basically. And then it interacts with, uh, with the UI. When you change something in the UI or you change something in the store, it will interact with the UI, it will change the UI. So you have the meat of this, the store in the middle, the UI layer, and you have a uh, display layer, for example, the SAS preview. So whenever you change something, for example, I, I change a variable, it does a call to the compiler. It says, here's my new program. And the compiler on the Drupal side compiles it and sends my e back the compiled code. And so that's basically the meat of the app. And if I drill down a little bit more in the Vuex uh, app, it has, uh, so you have the UX store, like the, with the JSON I was talking about. And then it has, the, the store is divided in uh, some modules that or allow me to do a more single responsibility principle, saying, okay, this module talks to the compiler, this module deals with sample programs, like that you can know, or just the surveys, or just the, the program itself is where it stores my program, right? Um, and then you have another layer of UI components that I built. Here, uh, you see in the white ones, the white circles, are all the custom ones I built for it, and then there's a few of them that are third party. Uh, like I mentioned, like a table viewer, or the pagination, or like the multi-select combo box. Um, and then there's another layer in view called plugins. I use a few of them. When you saw when you were deleting something, you had a confirm dialog. Like it's just a view plugin. Um, and the other one is the ITNN. That's another thing I really love with the view process is that ITNN is very similar to like a T function in Drupal. So if you're used to Drupal way of things, it's basically the same thing. <laughs> um, um, here you can see how you can reuse components inside it. As you, you, you saw in the demo, he was adding like calculations and he was adding <coughs> like a process inside another section. Um, you can see here, you get uh, with the, the blue box around, you get process template and another process template below is I'm using a different type of components. As you can see on the previous slide, I have uh, UI components that are con purely containers and others that are processes. Like by processes, I mean like what's a calculate or a conversion, and those are processes. But others are containers, like the, um, this process template. The job of a process template was just, uh, I don't want to redo the UI every time. So it's, it basically, it says, okay, it's a section, it has a header, it will include this UI with the button to delete and, and reorder things around, um, the comment button. So I'm reusing these patterns. So I have these containers, these processes, I have these, uh, in the middle you have input elements. Um, input elements is all the buttons, the, and the, like the, uh, the text boxes, and these I, I kept them as dumb as possible. At first I was trying to make them complex, very versatile, but the problem is um, you need to pass too many parameters into them. So I was like, okay, no, they're super dumb. All they do is they know their internal state and they just push what the new state is to the store, and the store deals with the business logic. So, the Drupal backend. The backend. So, what is this attached to? Um, so, at the end, we built what I'm going to call a partially decoupled application. Um, the Vue.js component was essentially behaves like a CK editor or WYSIWYG. It binds onto a text area and it puts some data into it. Um, we have a massive amount of data for all of those variables and surveys and things that were in the drop down list. Um, those are all nodes, and then there's an actual compiler that compiles the JSON that's generated by the Vue front end into SAS code. Um, the Drupal components, for the most part, are very simple. We used migration to create all the pieces of content. Um, when you click on the variables, that is actually just loading the, the node view pages of those variables in that dialog. So very simple. Um, 
The end goal of this is to let people log in and write their own programs and save them. So programs can be nodes. So we actually made um, a field widget and field formatter for that view program so that you can make a text editor be the RTRA SAS editor. And then you can, when you're viewing that field, that text field, you can make it render through the compiler so you see the compiled SAS. Um, and, then we wrote the, and then I wrote the SAS compiler as a Drupal service. Um, it's good, I can get through this quickly. So the SAS, the, the, what we were trying to figure out how to go from JSON to actually SAS, we was looking at a few things, but it, in the end, we realized that we, we really just needed to actually write a compiler. Um, and there's a lot of precedent for compilers in PHP. Um, we all use them every day. Twig is actually a full-on compiler. It compiles full Twig templates into PHP code, and then the PHP code is executed to actually make um, the pages show up. Um, and so this, well, we do a similar thing with, um, with our, we, we do something similar with ours. We actually wrote a full compiler to go from JSON object to SAS code. Um, and all component compilers are essentially architected this way and go through these steps. Um, the first step we do is lexical analysis. So that, for sure in a JSON object, there's not that much lexical about it, but what it is sort of breaking it up and making sure that all the components we need are there and you remove the superfluous stuff. So while if some compilers would remove spaces, um, our sort of rem removes sort of state information that gets stored in the array for the front end that the back end doesn't need. Sort of all the values for options the user has like put data into but then not selected. Um, all that gets removed and we actually get the core of the application. Uh, then we do syntax checking. So we go through the, all of the, the, uh, the data in the object to make sure that all the parts are complete enough to actually make a sensical SAS program with. Um, so every time they're referencing variables or referencing previous data sets, we make sure that all those are declared in the correct scope. Um, then we do uh, type checking, uh, which is where you run all of your, your program checks in there. Uh, in our compiler, we have a long list of different type checks we need. Uh, and those are sort of the things to make sure that your program is actually in, things are in the right order. Um, while you're writing, you have buttons to reorder the different clauses. So you can actually make invalid programs quite easily. Um, but we won't let you do that because sometimes you need to reorder programs and we don't want to just break or just say, yeah, we're not going to do that. And we need to let you try and then give you an error. Um, so that's the phase where we do type checking. Uh, as we're getting closer to the end, uh, we, there's an intermediate generation. So almost all compilers will generate an intermediate code before generating their final code. Um, if you're, and, and that's the case if you're, even if you're sort of, you're writing, your final code is sort of, uh, sort of x86 uh, assembly or, or machine code. Um, before you go there, you always compile into an intermediate code. And then you give that to a compiler that will compile into your individual frameworks. Um, and for, to, for what we're doing, is that is breaking all the different sections into their templatable sort of sections with all the arguments they need. So that uh, the last section, code generation, where we actually generate the SAS code for our project, we can then take our intermediate code and then template it into the, the actual complete SAS code. Um, and uh, that's about it. That's the architecture of this application. Um, and it, sort of surprisingly works very well. It's sort of been a pretty successful yeah, project. Yeah, what this data was amazing. Like we, we built <coughs> mostly the back end and I built the front end. Uh, we we're trying to find a, some, the, some uh, an API that we could talk to each other. But at some point, we just decided to put it together and it just worked. It was like, wow, I would never expect that. It, just, <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> one of the other also really proud moment we had on it is one of the first program, like the first program that was outputted on it actually ran. <laughs> RTRA. It was very simple, but it actually ran. So that was sort of a good milestone. But uh, yeah, we're a little over time, but if you have any questions before, uh, sure at the back. Since you guys are making an application for a federal web website, how do you tackle accessibility using a UGS? Um, <laughs> yes. <We're, laughs> so, yeah. Well, the requirement is we can 2.0, I think now is going to 2.1. 
So it, like double A. So it's quite stringent. Um, the idea is that the Vue.js outputs HTML. Anyways, so uh, I just need to make sure that every button as a, or every text field has a label, every button has hidden text that explains what this button is, like this, and the tabbing uh, works. There's a lot of work that's been around the tabbing. Yeah. Um, For Patrick's sake, I just have to say that JAWS on IE is terrible. Yeah, <laughs> we still have to support IE, right? And they test a lot in, in JAWS, because a lot of pe uh, people are still using JAWS. It's one of the biggest screen reader you know, on the market. And IE does weird things, plus JAWS doing weird things to the DOM uh, makes things tricky. Uh, we're currently, uh, this is not live yet, we're going through uh, rounds of accessibility testing. I'm hopeful. There's, we fixed a lot of issues quickly, but there's a few lingering ones, especially with complex combo box drop down option group that can, you can search on. Um, JAWS doesn't like those. Yeah, but you don't need to go as far as like, having it work without JavaScript because. No, 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 but that, that's a change from WCAG 1 to WCAG 2. Oh. WCAG 2, you don't, you can't say JavaScript is a requirement as long as it works uh, okay. in an accessible way. As yeah. long as it's described enough, it's like yes. a JavaScript. Yes, yes. Okay, great. Okay. So, so the question. The first one is that why do you just do one as a backend? Um, because of the massive amount of content and then the requirement that uh, in the sort of phase two, that they wanted people to be able to save programs online. Um, go into a portal, write a program in the UI, and sort of save it, have multiple programs, have various user accounts where they can sort of share them and things. And so we have, well, we have this sort of very highly dynamic system. We also sort of have all of these very, very traditional CMS requirements as well. Um, and so that's why we built this sort of hybrid system. Um, because we, like, in the, no matter what we did, we need so, to figure out something that would um, manage, like, I think we have, like, 40,000 nodes in the system to store all the variables and, uh, and data sets and things. So, like, we needed a robust CMS to back it. Um, oh, one thing I didn't talk about, uh, I sort of mentioned it on the slide. Um, we use the, the REST plugin for views for all of our uh, web services um, because JSON API just dies with the amount of data we're sending back and forth. So we discovered that like, if you're going to send 1,600 nodes uh, back and forth in one web service call, uh, you, need to make, you need to really craft it in view, uh, sorry, with views, not view, um, to only return the data that you need so that you can make it as small as possible. Because even though view loads all the nodes anyways, there's a major performance difference. So uh, we went through a few rounds of testing, and a lot of different sort of people tested it. Um, it sort of de deals with having really good clients. Um, the the client actually before it went to access to like accessibility testing, um, the client had their teams uh, test it to see if they could they could build programs with it, and they actually brought it to one of the SAS development teams and had them write SAS programs in it. And we got a lot of really good, interesting feedback from them. Um, and they really, like, they really ended up reinforcing one of our uh, development values uh, because a lot of their complaints are like, people can do stuff here and it's illegal in SAS. People do stuff here and it's illegal in SAS. People do stuff here and it's illegal in SAS. And then it was like, but people using our UI shouldn't Care. Yeah, the, should, the, the UI should fix the it. The purpose of our, our UI is yeah. not to teach you SAS, it's to make your program run. Yeah, yeah, to get you a <laughs> SAS program and teach you the, maybe teach you the abstract concepts, but yeah. like not not burden you with the minutia. And so that, that really helped. Um, and then uh, they went through a lot of accessibility testing, and they that's really what has been the bottleneck uh, because, as you can imagine, the like the accessibility team. Uh, it was fairly daunting when this arrived in their lab, and we're like, it's only one page. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they were like, we've never seen anything like this before. Um, so it took a long time to accessibility test, and uh, it's still it's still got a process that's ongoing. And uh, yeah, so how it was testing slowly, slow. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. it's slow going about as you'd expect. <laughs> Would you consider something more? 
Oh, so, yeah. yeah, you wrote that. Yeah, I started uh, playing uh, with know, Test Cafe, I think. I didn't really go far in there. It's, it's in the plans to eventually do a lot of automated testing, but it was changing too much to actually implement tests. Uh, so now, once we go, we're done with accessibility, then I want to implement a lot of tests to make sure that whenever in the future we change something, that it actually works. So yeah, um, I would test the front end with uh, Test Cafe, and we could test the back end with the hat, yeah, too. Do you find yourself getting confused when you're talking about view and views? All the time. The same sentence. So he's, <laughs> I'm he fresh, solved, right? He solved this problem. So I call it view. Okay. V and views. So we just, yeah, <laughs> we call it V and views. So yeah. VJS and yeah, and then you're not, you don't have a problem. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, everyone.